Hello everyone, welcome back to Spar and Brawl. My name is Cam and as always I'm joined by my co-host Sam. So we're doing a little special series of videos about the Iranian New Year right now since the Iranian New Year is on the 20th of March. But this video specifically won't talk about Iranian New Year or Nowruz as we've discussed that in just two other videos that we just recorded and have already uploaded to our channel. So go check those out. Here we're going to talk a bit more about historical politics and, and that kind of stuff. So let's get right into it, Sam. Can you tell me a little bit who have been Iran's historical enemies? But I mean, just go back, let's say, two centuries. Uh, if, if I may add, uh, we're going to do a proper history of Iran in like a, in, in short, in, you know, a, a small uh, amount of time, a bit of an overview later on. But first, we thought we just, yeah, geopolitically position Iran in the world, right? So, yeah, uh, Iran's historical enemies. Well, as a, any old nation, Iran has had many, many, many enemies, right? But um, uh, let's focus after Safavid era, which we, in our other videos, which I hope people check out, we already referred to them as So just Safavid. give a date, please, a date also included. Uh, they, they came to power in the 16th, 15th century, basically following the uh, fall of Ilkhanid Empire, the Mongolian Empire, and they laid the foundation for modern Iran basically, you know, the religion of modern Iranians, the largely the geographical location, all of that pretty much was formed during Safavid era. There, in, it, interestingly, during Safavid era, we had our first contact with European empires uh, in a direct and indirect way. At the time, the major European empire in global stage was uh, the Spanish and Portuguese uh, 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 crown, royal royalty. And the Portuguese were uh, very much active in southern Iran. They uh, conquered uh, Bahrain, which was regarded as part of Iran at the time. They took over even uh, southern shores of Iran, uh, uh, different ports. And in that time, Iran actually uh, uh, established connection with the East India Company, British East India Company, and through the help of British East India Company and combination of forces, basically, Safavid dynasty uh, uh, and some local rulers in the south, they managed to uh, get rid of the Portuguese empire and pretty much uh, destroy them, uh, you know, and uh, uh, there is very little of their influence left. So these are considered some of the earliest contacts between um, Iran and European empires that would go on to uh, dominate the world. Uh, after that, uh, again, during Safavid era, largely Iranian relations with Europeans remained good, especially with the British uh, and you know others to an extent, because Ottomans were aligned with the uh, French, and uh, uh, in court of Iranians, there were quite a number of British uh, people active, and they helped Shah Abbas greatly in organization of army, organization of spies, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, so, and because they were seen as, Safavid were seen as somebody who could distract Ottomans from their activities in Europe. So Europeans were quite a big fan and they supported Safavid at different times. Uh, but, but as time goes on and we get to, uh, we, we get to Qajar era, uh, things start to shift because British starts to encroach from uh, India towards Iranian territory. And then you have Russia from the north pushing southward. Peter the Great, in fact, uh, pretty much conquers half of Iran at some point. He's forced to uh, uh, pull back after Nadir Shah, the, the king that follows the Safavid, immediately beats them back. And then they sort of uh, later on, Aghamamad Qajar again beats them back. So. Uh, but then uh, when British and Russia become the, you know, main enemies of Iran, Iran starts to look to Napoleon for assistance and France. That turns out to be a big mistake because Napoleon is defeated before he can, he, he, Napoleon was planning to cut, uh, to go, uh, to, like they would, they were trying to connect through Caucasus when Napoleon defeats the Russians and all that. So that didn't work out very well for Iran. And Iran loses, uh, starts to lose a lot of significant amount of territory in the east to uh, eastern 
south to the British and northwest to the Russian. In fact, there are two events in Iranian history, two treaties signed between Iranian Empire and the Russian Empire that are viewed by the general, my apologies, viewed by the general public as uh, some of the most humiliating defeats in Iran's history. Uh, in these treaties, uh, what is now called Armenia and Azerbaijan and half of Georgia are separated from Iran. And for Qajars especially, but for all Iranians, these places had huge symbolic and, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, not just symbolic and a lot of national pride rested there. And this was like, for example, Dasht e Mughan, which is half in Iran, half in Azerbaijan now. It was the place where Iranian kings would announce uh, their uh, their king, uh, their kinghood. I don't know. <laughs> they announced that they're kings now. All right. Just get on with it. And so uh, these were seen as hugely humiliating to Iran. And they kind of showed how backward Iran was at least in terms of a nation state in relation to Russia uh, and Europeans, because Russia was seen as the weaker of European empires. So there is a deep, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, there is a deep uh, uh, rivalry between Russia and Britain in Iran. They, uh, uh, in Iran, and they try to control politicians and uh, people in in the South, Britain pretty much sets up a sort of apartheid state. They control the oil and everything. There is different bathrooms for Iranians than the, for the British, that type of thing. In the North, Russians have a lot of influence. Um, and uh, this is, by the way... We Sorry, is this... Yeah, I was going to say, is this late 1800s or is this already early 1900s? 18, no, uh, 1800s. With 1900s, 10 years in, uh, there is a revolution in Russia, in which uh, the October Revolution, yeah. which leads to Russia basically pulling back from Iran. Russia, Russian white forces uh, left without a leader in Iran. So this is mostly 18th century, and this is when the great game is played by Britain and Russia in Asia and by other great powers that they are trying to carve up Asia uh, among uh, themselves and. Uh, there is, in fact, a plan uh, to carve up Iran at this point uh, into three different pieces, the south for the British, the north for the Russian, and a very a small center remaining for the Iranian local government. When the Russian Revolution happens, th this is one of the things that sort of um, they publish publicly as a way to uh, the Bolsheviks uh, to prove that the czarist regime was an evil regime, and uh, that actually helps Iran to, you know, not get basically carved up by great powers. There is, and but following the Russian revolutions, Russian sort of, you know, uh, they fall back in terms of like influence and all that. So you have British basically controlling all the politicians, controlling everything. The Reza Khan comes to power with the support of British General Ironside. Uh, 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 and if I'm not mistaken, Lorraine, uh, British amb ambassador in Iran, play a very important role in his uh, uh, in his uh, uh, his rise to power, I suppose. And I would say Iranian public, even to this day, they have a huge resentment towards the British uh, culture. Well, British, not culture, sorry, British elite and politicians and all that. And there is always uh, there's a book by Jack Straw, I think, that is, the name of the book is based on Iranian saying that is always, there's a British behind everything, or there's an Englishman behind everything. Um, so that th these, in modern times, these are the conflicts that dominated Iran. Following the 1953 coup and removal of Mossadegh, uh, America, which until then had a very, very positive image in Iran, you even have a American... Um, uh, teacher fighting in Tabriz, fighting with constitutional revolutionaries, and there is a tomb uh, in his name in Tabriz. So Iranians had a very positive image of U.S. as a sort of a, somebody who was fighting European colonialism. But uh, following the coup d'etat, increasingly America becomes the focus of Iranian uh, hatred and resentment of you know foreign interference and all that. And uh, these days, I would say. 
since the heavy sanction re regime uh, came back under Obama and then the maximum pressure campaign under Trump, again, there is a lot of resentment towards American politicians. Although I would say that the British thing is uh, still a very, very strong presence in Iraq. And it's good, uh, not good, but it's important to point, point out that Iranians also have significant resentment towards uh, Arab uh, nations and Arab leaders. In, in my view, not towards Arab people, because, uh, for example, there was an Iranian actor who one time described an event as a joke. Like, he, he said something that, and in that telling of the story, he said, this man, this Arab man, like, uh, in, a, in a negative way. He didn't say anything negative. He, uh, he said it with a very, very bad tone. And there was a, there was a massive public uh, pressure campaign that you should apologize, you shouldn't call, if you have many Arabs in Iran, even if you want to criticize, you should, if, and he came and he apologized, I mean, he meant, I didn't mean any Arab, I meant this specific person, blah, blah, blah. So I think, but Iranians are very resentful of, uh, you know, uh, Arabic leaders and their attempts, they think they're always trying to, you know, uh, plot against them and, you know, uh, undercut them. There is also a great amount of rivalry be between Iranians and Turks. I mean, for during all of Safavid era for 300 years, these are were very, very, uh, you know, they were rivals and Ottomans were controlling all Arab lands. They were, they, they were the country we had the most borders with. So there are also those type of rivals going on. But you know, um, I suppose, yeah. If if you want to add a list of enemies and why. Okay, that was really great, really great. So um, the British thing is funny. I had when I lived in Iran, I never picked up on the hate. I mean, I was a kid, and you know, and I. I think the hate towards the British had decreased a bit, probably because they had become much more relevant. But but that's very fascinating and interesting. But so was Iran has never been quote unquote colonized though, right? No, no, Iran has never uh, been colonized. The plan was uh, sort of fell through. Uh, Iran was sort of um, Iran was. Uh, I mean, there is an argument that during the later stage of Qajar, southern Iran was pretty much a British colony. But at least it officially wasn't. And uh, no, because, uh, you know, in fact, Indians and Arabs to an extent view Iranians and Turks as colonizers. You know, for a lot of them, the history of empires doesn't start with European empires. It starts with Islamic and Turkic Perso empires. So... No, Iran was never officially colonized, but I would say the situation in late Qajar era Iran and early Pahlavi Iran was similar to that of South America following the collapse of the Spanish Empire in that British money was running everything. You know, everybody was in the pocket of the British in one way or another. So Exactly. And I mean, there are so many stories about the oil industry, I guess, from, from that era, which are fascinating to maybe get into mm -hmm. one day. Uh, but okay, so this question though, so we you talked a little bit actually touched on it. So Iran's relationship with its Arab neighbors, what's Iran's contemporary relationship with its Arab and non-Arab neighbors? So really, the countries in the region. Sure. To be fair, I mean, for a for a very contemporary look, try please to check out our videos and like and subscribe and all that because that's a lot of our coverage goes to that. Um, but Iran has a very mixed, uh, generally I would say Iranians sort of, just like Turks, in a way they view all, there is a bit of a patronizing or condescending look from, the, like Turks and Iranians sort of view these as former lands that belong to us and we should rule again. So there is that uh, strain within Iranian thought, I think, not a very positive one perhaps. But uh, Iran has... Specifically, Iran has very negative relations with Saudi Arabia, obviously. Uh, with UAE, it's a bit of a mixture, very negative political relations, but one of the bigger economic partners. You have uh, other countries like Oman uh, that have relatively good relations with Iran. Kuwait, somewhat, be you know, somewhat better than Saudis. They play the middle ground. Uh, 
Uh, so you can't say Iran's relations to Arab countries because it's really varied nation to nation. Or, for example, they you know they have very good relations with Palestinian authorities uh, and Qatar. Uh, uh, and Qatar, yeah, they, but you know they have very, very negative relations with uh, uh, UAE and Saudi, uh, and uh, for example, Egypt. Egypt is a major enemy of Iran because Iran. Um, there was a, uh, the person who uh, assassinated Anwar Sadat was hailed as a national hero in Iran, and Egypt gave refugee to. Uh, Mohammad Reza Shah. So, you know, because of that, the relations with mm -hmm. Egypt is very strained, very strained indeed. And uh, so, you know, a very complicated relationship. And Arabs are, I think, uh, at least not all Arabs, obviously, certain groups within uh, uh, Arab community believe that Iran is, uh, you know, they are planning as soon as America or whoever is allies of Arabs goes, they're going to take over, they're going to attack them, they they have, they want to revive their old empire. So, you know, the, the relationship is characterized by that. With Turkey, Iran's relationship has been a sort of a good natured rivalry, I would say. They tend to not interfere in each other's politics uh, since at least Safavid onwards. And in fact, they've played a stabilizing role in each other's country. And generally, I would say Iranians and Turks are very, very far more similar in terms of culture and everything than either side wants to admit. Uh, sadly, Iran never really been active in terms of its relations with Caucasus or Central Asia, because these are countries with significant historical, uh, Iranian historical baggage, Iranian, uh, like Tajikistan is, they speak Farsi. But, you know, there hasn't been much active relations with those countries, but they, they keep good relations with everybody. With Armenia, they have a especially strong relation, uh, uh, been a supporter of Armenia for a long time. Uh, Afghanistan, they played a more important role because, uh, you know, Afghanistan, uh, situation in Afghanistan plays significant uh, role in Iran, like uh, the drug trade, civil war, all of that, you know, affects Iran significantly. So in Afghanistan, they you know, they've been playing a role for a long time. They supported the Northern Alliance before America's end, uh, invasion of Afghanistan, and they still are one of the big players there. With Pakistan, uh, they have a very a strange relationship because Pakistan is, you know, it's an Islamic country, but it's a Sunni country, and it's traditionally more, uh, more of an ally of Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, it has major land border with Iran, and uh, they used to be great relations between the two. It's been very, it, it very much depends on the government of uh, Islamabad and Pakistan and how close they are to Saudis, because Pakistan, due to financial and economic troubles, uh, sometimes has to basically uh, follow the lead of Saudis or others in many ways. Uh, but interestingly, for example, Emran Khan, the current uh, pr prime Minister of uh, Pakistan or President? My apologies, I can't remember. Yeah, I'm not he's sure. Si he's significantly influenced by Ali Shariati's writing, who was seen as a major uh, uh, ideologue behind the Iranian Revolution. Somebody who died before the Iranian Revolution, but his thought heavily influenced political Islam and uh, in around the world. So uh, there are deep kind of, one of the major po poets of Persian language is Iqbal Lahuri, who's a Pakistani. He like uh, um, he's seen as a major figure in Pakistan's independence movement and literature, you know all that. So Iran has uh, yeah very mixed relations with its neighbors, but I would say besides the Arab nations and Middle East, if we take them away, Iranian foreign policy has always been somewhat reactive rather than active and you know uh, they they usually wait for events to happen and then they react they don't they don't develop relationships they don't you know do that type of thing oh uh, it's important to mention between the arab nations iran probably has the strongest historical and uh, economic and political ties to iraq and lebanon uh, because these are also countries with largely shia populations these are countries where iran has spent a lot of time and money during the last 50 years or so. And uh, yeah, so.
Very fascinating. Yeah, and did you mention overview. India? No, no, because uh, India is not a name yeah. per, per, per se. Yeah, that's but, true. But uh, I mean, I would say, yes, uh, uh, with India, relations are usually good. India is a big buyer of Iranian oil and they uh, export a lot of uh, steel and other things to Iran. Uh, relations with India historically has been quite yeah, interesting. You know, historically, we always fought Hindustan or the, uh, you know, Mughal Empire, India over Kandahar and all that. But uh, since the modern times and the modern nation states, India, you know, it's been very, very neutral, I would say, mm -hmm. largely, their relations. India was closer to Soviet Union back in the days, and Iran was closer to U.S. And then after the revolution and changes, now India is closer to U.S. and Iran is closer to Russia. So, you know, there are these things, but they don't seem to affect their relationship too much, although India was one of the nations that reduced its oil, oil purchases from Iran during the last few years, which Iran took great offense at and was not happy about. Okay, okay, very nice. And thank you everybody for watching. Please like and subscribe. So Sam, let's end on a, with the last question on a positive note. I mean, it's kind of easy question you could say, but so who are Iran's contemporary partners? Kind of mentioned some of them right now. I mean, you said Iran has a very close relationship, of course, with Iraq and Lebanon, but yeah, even outside the region. I mean, these are as we, these are very political questions and have can have you know. I, I look, for example, Iran's biggest economic partners used to be uh, before the five years ago. For example, was European Union, right, uh, and U UAE, uh, another one, for example. It's very strange because Iran. Right now, China plays a much bigger role in Iran's economy. Right now, politically speaking, Iran is seen is see, seems to be allied with Russia and China. That seems to be the case, politically speaking, on the international stage. However, it has major economic relations with European countries, especially Austria and Germany. Austria is usually Iran's biggest economic partner within Europe. Iran is also expanding uh, its own sort of a sphere of influence in Lebanon, Iraq, and Africa. There is what some analysts call what's uh, called a scramble for Africa going on again right now, where with China, America, and Russia, you know, vaccine have become an, a new era, a new field, a new theater for you know uh, for international politics an to be played. Entry point at the very least. So Iran is also, like, for example, they supported Shia movements in Nigeria or uh, that type of thing. So Iran is growing its its own web of allies as well. But Iran is seen largely as a uh, as an ally of uh, China and Russia. I would say that the Russia one is, to an extent, uh, exaggerated. Interestingly, for example, when you live in Turkey or uh, uh, or when you go to Russia, Russian-speaking countries, or Russia, you see far more of the products of the two countries, like Turkish products in Russia or Russian products in Turkey, right? And you see far more tourists of the two nations. Iranians don't really, you don't see that much economic cooperation with Russia. You don't see that much ease of travel with Russia. Uh, with China, uh, what you see is major, major infrastructural projects taking place with Russia, as well as just like everywhere else in the world, Iran pretty much imports everything from Russia, uh, China as well. Uh, so uh, I would say Iran is largely, like most nations, in, uh, is not part of a very fixed alliance, right? And But, uh, you know, uh, but right now, politically, they are closer to Russia and China right now. I think they want to be closer to Europeans, though, in, in their heart of hearts, the current government and the state. They want to be closer to European Union because there's more money there and all that. Uh, but I don't think that's politically feasible anymore, uh, at least for a while. Yeah, very true. Very good stuff. And yeah, it is always fluid and moving. And I mean, China is China, but I guess Iran also had a little alliance going on with Brazil and Venezuela maybe like 10 years ago. But that was more probably spiritual, yeah, that, maybe uh, some selling of no, no, oil, no. of course. or was Se it? Uh, With Venezuela, you can say it's grown. They, For example, they sent a lot of petrol 
or mm -hmm. as Americans call it, gas to Venezuela. That uh, during the gas hard to times, gas rich countries. There, are, so. there is a lot of there is an Iranian company called Kaysen, which is a major, one of the top hundred companies in the world in terms of infrastructure and housing. And Kaysen has built a lot of projects in Venezuela and uh, less so in Brazil because Brazil, even though the president was very, they were all leftist and they were sort of. Uh, you know, on the same messaging as Iranian uh, government, they, they're, they're still the industries were controlled by very much pro-American forces and all that. But yeah, the relations with, just like Africa, relations with South America has grown significantly as well Yeah. Uh, in recent years. Okay, very fascinating stuff. So as we mentioned a few times, we made all these videos about Iran because it's the Iranian New Year on the 20th of March, and we recorded videos specifically about Iranian New Year or Norus. So please go check those out as well. But yeah, anything else, Sam? No, and uh, yeah, these videos sort of, um, because we record the, all of this in one go, so, you know, they sort of, we refer to content from other videos and yeah. stuff. I apologize for any inconsistencies, any unclarity, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy them, and I think yeah, these videos go well together. Sort of, we try to cover some very basic information about Iran that if you have, then you can basically get into more details more easily. Um, exactly. And please give us your feedback as well, because hopefully we're going to do more topical content rather than just, you know, covering news analysis. Yeah. Maybe start doing looking at issues more significantly. Uh, yeah, but we'll return to the Iranian nuclear deal and all that stuff and of course Iranian elections in a few months so we'll be covering all of that but yeah thank you everybody for watching please share your comments and thoughts as Sam said in the description box and we'll see you in our next video thank you